Okay, now we're going to look at velocity vectors in three dimensions. Okay, let's look at uh, instantaneous velocity in one dimension before we try to tackle three. And this is a bit of a review, but if I have a point here and a point there, if I connect those two with a straight line, I know that the slope of that line is going to be given by a delta x over a delta t, and that's going to be my average velocity. So the slope of the line between any two points on a position versus time graph, position versus time graph, is going to be the velocity. But if I want to know what the velocity is at a particular instant in time, I need to take the limit as my time interval goes to zero. So I let my time interval get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And as I do, this line between those two points converges to become a tangent line at my point of interest. And the slope of that tangent line is the velocity at that point. And we know that that's going to be given by the derivative uh, dx over dt. And so that would be my instantaneous velocity, the derivative of the position function with respect to time. And we know on any position versus time graph, the velocity is going to be, the instantaneous velocity is going to be given by the slope of the tangent line at every point. So if I picked a different point, say a point up here, there would be a different tangent line, one that just kissed that curve at that one point, not intersecting any of the others, and the slope of that line would be the velocity at that point. Now let's extend this to three dimensions. So I've got this blue or teal curve, which is just this curving uh, path in space, and I have picked a position vector, which I've called R1, and that R1 is going to a particular point in space. Now you can imagine some object that's following this path, and so I pick it up here at R1, and it goes to another position, it goes all along the path, so I can pick another point on that curve and draw an R2. And so I've got uh, R1, which is a position vector to one point, and R2 is a position vector to another point. And in 3D, the displacement works exactly the same way. So I can draw a vector from my initial position to my final position, and that would be my displacement vector, delta R. And of course, that's the vector from where you start to where you end up and it would be the vector subtraction r2 minus r1. That would be r2 vector minus r1 vector. And it works the same in three dimensions as it does in two or even one dimension. Uh, the definition of displacement works the same way. So we have our displacement vector delta r, which is r2 minus r1, and of course we call that the change in position. That's what that symbol delta means, change in. And that's our displacement vector. Now, what is R2? What is R1? R1 is going to be a vector that's going to have some value x1, y1, z1. And those would be the x, y, and z coordinates of those vectors. And similarly, R2 would be some x2, y2, z2. and that would be the coordinates of the vector r2. And so those are the points that those vectors point to, and of course I can use those as the components in the vector notation form that we've seen with x hat, y hat, and z hat. So I can simply say that my r2 vector is x2 in the x hat direction plus y2 in the y hat direction plus z2 in the z hat direction, and similarly for r1 with the components x1, y1, and z1. And again, remember, these are just numbers. You know, x1, y1, z1, that could be 3, 7, minus 4. Whatever numbers they point to, that would be the numbers of those components. Now, if I take this delta r, that's going to be uh, the vector subtraction. And so I would just subtract these two vectors here. And so how do you do that? Remember, you group the, the like terms. So I've got my x hat terms together. And so r2 minus r1 is going to be x2 minus x1 times I, x hat. So that will be the first term for delta r. We can say that delta r vector is going to be x2 minus x1 in the x hat direction. And then we'll have the same thing for y hat 
direction we'll have y2 minus y1 so that would be plus y2 minus y1 in the y hat direction and then we also have the final case of z2 minus z1 in the z hat direction but what is x2 minus x1? That's just delta x. What is y2 minus y1? That would be delta y, and so on. And so we can write our delta r in terms of x, y, and z. So again, we have our delta r here, and we can write it as delta r is equal to delta x in the x hat direction, plus delta y in the y hat direction, plus delta z in the z hat direction. And remember, what's x? What's delta x? It's just x2 minus x1. This would be y2 minus y1. This would be z2 minus z1. And just like we did before, if I want to find the average velocity, I just take my delta r and I divide it by delta t. And so I would have my delta x over delta t, because I'm taking this term, dividing it by delta t. I take this term, divide it by delta t. That gives me delta y over delta t. And, of course, delta z divided by delta t gives me that term. And we keep the x hat, y hat, and z hat unit vectors. And I can make a definition that my delta x over delta t is just vx. And vx is the x component of the average velocity. And so I can do the same thing for vy and vz. And so that gives us the way to calculate the average velocity in three dimensions. We just do the same thing we did in one dimension three times. Delta x over delta t, delta y over delta t, and delta z over delta t. So let's look at an example now. We have uh, this example. A mass is initially located at a position r0. Uh, zero is sometimes used for the initial position of something. It stands for the position of it at t equal to zero. That's why it's often used for initial position. So my initial position vector here is 3 in the i hat direction, minus 4 in the j hat direction, plus 2 in the k hat direction. So I'm using the i hat, j hat, k hat notation here. Uh, I mentioned that I want you guys to be fluent in using both it and the x hat, y hat, z hat notation. So I'm going to mix these up into the problems so that you get a good uh, opportunity to work with both kinds. But just remember, it goes in order, x, y, z, i, j, k. So this x... This i hat is along the x-axis, j hat is along the y-axis, k hat is along the z-axis, and the hats, of course, tell us that we're talking about unit vectors. Anyway, our initial position is 3i hat minus 4j hat plus 2k hat in meters. And so my mass, which is initially at this position, moves to a new position, some r final, rf, equals to minus i hat, plus 8j hat, plus 6k hat. And remember, with that minus i hat, there is a 1 understood to be in front of that i, so it's minus 1 i hat there. Anyway, uh, so this motion from r naught to rf takes place over an interval of 2 seconds. And the question in the problem is, what is the displacement of this mass? And then what is the average velocity of the mass? Now, the displacement is given by the formula for displacement. Delta R is going to be RF minus R0. And it's always going to be where you end up minus where you started. Where you end up minus where you started. So we can just plug in the number. So we've got our displacement value here. And so here's my R final, minus I hat plus 8J hat plus 6K hat in meters minus my r naught, which is 3i hat minus 4j hat plus 2k hat in meters. Now, what I want to do is notice that this minus sign in front of this parentheses will actually distribute inside here, and that'll make this minus 3, it'll make that plus 4, and then minus 2. And when I do the subtraction, I'm basically just going to be... Uh, grouping like terms again, the i hat, the j hat, and the k hat. So I've got here a minus 1 i hat and a minus 3 i hat. They're going to group together, so that gives me minus 1, minus 3 i hat. Uh, 
I've got a plus 8 J hat. This minus minus makes a plus, so that gives me plus 4 J hat. And then I've got plus 6 K hat. This minus sign is going to come in here and make that minus 2 K hat. I've factored out all my unit vectors, and so then I can just combine these terms. And so my answer is that the displacement is delta R equals to minus 4 in the I hat direction, plus 12 in the J hat direction, plus 4 in the K hat direction in meters. And so that is my delta R, the displacement. Now to get the average velocity, we just want to divide the displacement by the time. And so the average velocity is going to be delta R over delta T. And my delta R, we have minus 4 I hat plus 12 J hat plus 4 K hat in meters. That's what we got on the previous uh, part of the problem. And we're going to divide that by the time interval, which was given to be 2 seconds. And so 4 divided by 2 makes minus 2. 12 divided by 2 makes 6. 4 divided by 2 makes 2. So our average velocity works out to be minus 2 I hat plus 6 J hat plus 2 K hat meters over seconds or meters per second. And that's the answer to the problem. Now let's look at instantaneous velocity because this is really the more important thing that we want to be able to understand and calculate. And so again, we have our average velocity and we can write that all out. But what we want to do to get the instantaneous velocity is take the limit of, as delta t goes to zero of this delta r over t. And we know that as we do that, the, this line here is going to become tangent to the, point, to the curve at the point of interest. So you might wonder, what about instantaneous velocity? Now, it works the same way. We have this idea of an instantaneous velocity being the average velocity, the displacement divided by the time, but you take the limit as the time interval shrinks. So rather than an average velocity, say, between that point and that point, if I want to know what the instant velocity is right there, I take my time interval and I shrink it smaller and smaller, and I take the limit as that time interval goes to zero, and I zoom in on a velocity. Now, we've talked a little bit about how this is something that comes out of calculus. And so when you take this limit, you're going to have three terms. You're going to have a displacement along the x direction, a displacement along the y direction, a displacement along the z direction, each of them divided by the time. And when you take the limit as delta t, these turn into what are called derivatives in calculus. And you can usually write that as like dx over dt. If any of you have had calculus, you'll probably recognize this notation. But the good news is, is that in general physics, we don't really do anything with calculus. So what I really want you to understand is just that there is a process by which we can consider an average velocity and shrink that time interval to zoom in and find the actual velocity at a particular point in time. And it's going to have some value in the x direction, some value in the y direction, some value in the z direction. And we could just call that the x component of the velocity, the y component of the velocity, and the z component of the velocity. And that would be our uh, expression for the instantaneous velocity in three dimensions. Now, the one thing that I want to point out is that when you have a particle that is moving along a curved path, at every point on the path, the velocity is always going to be tangent to that path. That's something that you can actually prove with calculus, but uh, I just want you guys to accept that because it's an important idea that we'll be using later, that the velocity of something moving along a curved path is always tangent to that path.